Okay. So let's work through exam B. This is the 2011-2012 sample exam. So which of the following examples, which of the following uh, describes a population? Find a spot somewhere, fellas. You need a data booklet if you don't have one. And we're doing example B, exam B. If you don't have an exam, I printed some up. I'll get some in a bit. What is the population? Well, first of all, we had some key words. We had uh, species. That meant everything was the same type of life, animal, or plant. We had community, which I can't spell for some reason. That was all of the different living things in an area, the community. Population was also all of the same species. But what was the difference between a species and a population? Yes, a population, everything, all of the same species in one area. Species anywhere on the planet. So uh, robins, the birds, live all over North America. That would be the species. Uh, the population would be the robins in the Pitt Meadows area, for example. Oh, and then we have the small one. Organism, right? Okay. Those of you that are just getting here, I'll interrupt in about 10 minutes and explain what's going on, but follow along. So what's the correct answer? Sorry? B? Woohoo! We all got one right. Uh, which world bi biome is represented by this photograph? I know it's not that. I know it's not that. It ain't that. Yeah, it's tundra. Now, if they were sneaky, this would be difficult if they'd also said permanent. I oh, no, no. I see short grasses. I tundra. Okay? They're not going to try and give you one that's really, really hard to figure out. It will be reasonably obvious. They're going to give you little articles to read. Yes, you're going to have to read and interpret and underline key words. So in the question, the key word is abiotic. What does abiotic mean? Non-living. So if they're talking about species or predators or prey or parasites, no, uh, 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 you're not going to trick me. Non-living, I'm looking for things like precipitation, temperature, sunlight, soil. So let me read. Climate change is causing wildflowers to move to higher altitudes and probably to their eventual extinction. So, uh, well, I can already eliminate some wrong answers. Uh, those two are wrong because those are not, a in fact, you know what? Even competition is a more of a biotic factor. So it, it's one species competing with another species for the same resources. I actually didn't even read the article, but I should read the article. As I read through this, it looks like they will become extinct if the climate continues to be warm there's the abiotic factor. Uh, by the way, if you haven't already learned this trick on multiple choice, you always cross out answers that you know are wrong as soon as you know they're wrong. You're always glancing at the answers, keep reading. Glance at the answers, keep reading. Glance at the answers, keep reading. You'll often find, for those of you, for example, who did the math provincial, there was probably 10 questions. You didn't need to do the whole thing and you could quit and get rid of all the wrong answers and just stop. You didn't need to go all the way. It saves time. You've been asked to test a controlled experiment to test the effect, to design a controlled experiment to test the effect of light on the growth of tomato plants. Oh, geez, that's terrible. On the growth of tomato plants. Which of the following hypotheses is valid? So I want to look at how light affects tomato plant growth, and I don't want to introduce any other strange variables. Uh, for example, in D, say what? Didn't want anything about temperature. Where'd that come from? That'd be a bad experiment. Um, in C, we've introduced different sized plants. We've added an extra factor. Nuh uh. So I'm looking at A or B. Oh, in A, we suddenly added what? That's not what we wanted to measure. Now, we wanted to test the effect of light on the growth of tomato plants as the t length of time tomato plants are exposed to light increases, their growth increases. You'll notice the same two things appear in your answer that you're trying to test or hypothesize for. This is asking, can you figure out an experiment? <coughs> kind of wishy-washy, but it works. A grasshopper is a... 
Pardon me? Let's see. It's not a producer. Those are plants. What's a detrivore? Eats dead things. So think slugs, think bacteria, think grubs, think maggots, think worms. So it ain't that. It's either a primary consumer or a secondary consumer. Which one? Why? What does it eat? Which of those is a secondary consumer? Come on in. Sparrow. Okay. Uh, possibly owl. An owl might eat grasshoppers. I don't know. I suspect they're not too fussy. But looking at this little food chain, they're suggesting that the owl eats the sparrow, eats the grasshopper, eats the grass. What is the owl considered? Uh, tertiary. We're live. Here we go. Uh, which of the following graphs represents the relative numbers of organisms in a food chain? How does the food chain work? You need more of the smaller animals, fewer of the predators. So you're looking for one that goes, so lots of grass, then fewer grasshoppers. And this is because the energy transfer is not 100% efficient. We use most of the energy that we take in to run our internal processes and our body heat. We only pass about anywhere from 10 to 20% of our energy onto the next part of the food chain. That's why a mountain lion has to eat several deer. A deer has to eat a whole bunch of grass, but a grass only has to have a little bit of soil. Right? The greatest biomagnification. What's biomagnification? It's because of the same idea. It's because of this food pyramid or this food chain here. The fact that this owl is going to eat a whole bunch of sparrows if this, these grasshoppers had some pesticide on them. Well, if this grass had some pesticide, these grasshoppers would eat the grass. they probably survive just fine. Maybe a little bit of d damage, but they'd be okay. Then the grasshoppers are eaten by the sparrows. Well, the sparrow eat 10 grasshoppers. It's got 10 times as much pesticide. Now the owl eats the sparrows. It's got way more. That's biomagnification. So the owl. Use the following information to answer question eight. We're talking about mutualism. Mutualism is, mutualism is when both organisms benefit. So let's read. Tiny bacteria carrying worms can be used as a biological control for cockroaches. The worm has no known effect on other soil dwelling organisms, plants, or humans. The worm penetrates the cockroach and releases bacteria to kill the insect. After breeding for several ge generations inside the corpse, the food supply is exhausted and hundreds of tiny bacteria carrying worms break out looking for new cockroaches to infect. Mutualism, they both have to benefit. Sorry? The worms benefit and the bacteria benefit? It's not the worms and the cockroaches. The, in fact, you know what? The cockroach is not benefiting in any of this. Poor roaches. Did I do this one already? No? Apparently I must have done this with a student already. Well, uh, how does melting permafrost affect carbon stores in the carbon cycle? So I said, okay, I probably opened up my data booklet to the carbon cycle just to make myself happy, but here's what it says. The thawing of vast stretches of Canadian permafrost is expected to liberate billions of tons of stored methane and carbon dioxide. Ah, but it may be much less of a threat than previously believed. So I would say, okay, maybe not as big as we thought. Although the melting will release huge amounts of greenhouse gases, researchers who sampled and that's from the permafrost. Researchers who sampled three sites have discovered that the warmer, softer, wetter soil also pr pr promotes the growth of new mosses that capture and store about as much as the thawed ground releases. Ah, so the thawed, thawed ground releases. So carbon stores in organic is going to decrease in the soil. It's going to release carbon stores from the soil. However, the moss, which is terrestrial vegetation, correct answer? Yeah. 
see. And whenever they give me one of these charts, I always go down the first column with check marks and X's, then I go down the next column with check marks and X's, and then I zoom out. Uh, the number of times I've circled the wrong answer, even though I did it right, has driven me crazy. Help yourself to an exam if you don't have an exam. Who's your teacher? Uh, Miss Howard. So I think you do have exam B if you have Miss Howard, yes? So let's see if you got it. Number 10. Which of the following is a valid contrast between the phosphorus cycle and the nitrogen cycle? You folks probably want to stay on this question, but right now I would be blazing off to my phosphorus and nitrogen cycle. Oh, this is kind of crooked. That's not going to work very well, Mr. Duick. Let's do this again. I can handle this. Let me pause the video for one second. Okay. Now, the correct answer, by the way, is B. Let's see if we can convince ourselves why that's the case. It's talking about nitrogen entering terrestrial ecosystems through fertilizer, but phosphorus does not. So if we go look at this, uh, where's my nitrogen cycle? Here's my, here, here's my phosphorus cycle. You know what? I noticed that phosphorus, where's the little hand so you guys can see, phosphorus does enter this uh, through fertilizers. So when it says phosphorus does not, I would say no, no. Uh, phosphorus enters through leaching and runoff. Uh, sorry, nitrogen enters through leaching and runoff, but phosphorus does not. Uh, leaching and, you know what, I'm seeing, I'm leaching into soil. You know what, phosphorus does enter by leaching into soil. This is why I said, I th someone earlier asked me about some of these nitrogen cycle phosphorus. It's all on the chart somewhere. You gotta go hunting for it, but it's all on there. So I would say, uh, no. Uh, Decay, and pla uh, decay of plant and animal waste. Does phosphorus enter th via, via the decay of plant and an Oh, what do I see right here? So apparently it does enter via or via de uh, plant and animal waste. So it's not that one either. Now let's convince ourselves. And you'll notice I tackled the one that, was, that said not because I figured all I needed to do was find that word on there. Then it does. That means that answer is wrong. Okay, uh, nitrogen enters the atmosphere through bacterial action. Phosphorus does not. I don't think you'll find bacterial action on here anywhere. But if you go to nit, oh, where's nitrogen? Where is nitrogen? Last one. Because why wouldn't you have all the cycles in a row? Okay, uh, nitrogen. I see bact uh, bacteria, ba bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. I see lots of bacterial action. Climatographs. Remember on a climatograph, the bars are the rain, the line is the temperature. So which represents a city in the desert in the southern hemisphere? Now, first of all, if you're in the southern hemisphere, your temperature graph is going to look like that because it's going to be cold in our summer and warm in our winter. Northern hemisphere, your temperature graph is going to look like that, roughly. So I would be going uh, no, no, probably no. Oh. It's got to be C. Now let's check out the precipitation. If it's a desert, I'm looking for uh, very little precipitation. So no, could be, maybe, probably. So no, no, it's got to be C, right? Use the following information to answer question 12. Which biome exists today and which biome would have existed 255 million years ago at location X? So you have your biome sheet. Location X, that looks like South America to me, yes? Right there. I think right here. Are we going with tropical rainforest or grassland? I think we're going with tropical rainforest. Now, again, this would, oh, sorry, wrong, wrong, yes, yes. This would have been tough if they'd also included grassland, but they made it obvious. There's not a desert in the Amazon. There is, by the way, in South America, right over here, a very, very nasty desert right there, but not here. Now, let's work our way back. 250 million years ago, dry, low attitude climate. So this is the climate, 250, low latitude climate, 255 million years ago. So it would be dry, probably would have been desert 250 million years ago. What's the correct answer, humans? Woohoo. Okay. A food web diagram. 
Okay. A food web diagram says, which of the following is most likely a keystone species in the community illustrated? The one that's got the most arrows hitting it. If you're looking for a way to remember, but yeah, that's the one that seems to be the involved with the most different little populations. So if something goes wrong with the sea star population, that tells you there's something major going on somewhere. Or if you have an increase in the sea star population, that's going to affect all of the populations below it. The breakdown of organic substances, including pollutants into simpler compounds through biological action is called, well, I know it's not biodiversity. Biodiversity means lots of different living things. I know that biomagnification is that process of uh, toxins advancing their way up through the food chain, so I know it ain't that. Bioaccumulation is similar. You know, oh, you know, breaking down, I think degradation is breaking down. Biodegradation would be the breaking down of stuff by living things. Okay. Did you get a, you got an exam to follow along with? You did? Okay. Icebergs break, uh, 15 and 16. Oh, a little thingy here. Okay. What occurs in the halo zone around these icebergs? Okay. Uh, I'm looking for, oh, the halo effect. I see the word halo effect right there. The, inc the release of nutrients trapped by icebergs creates a halo effect with a significantly increased phytoplankton and krill populations. So you have uh, more krill and phytoplankton, and the higher abundance of krill and phytoplankton attracts other forms of sea life and may help offset climate change by absorbing large amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere. So let's go look. As prey population, uh, no, it doesn't decrease, it increases. Predator population, what? I think as your prey goes up, your predator go up, yes? Because it says that, uh, blah, 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 blah. There you go. Thriving communities of seabirds above and a web of phytoplankton and blah, 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 blah. It is D, yes? I hope. Yeah, hoo, hoo. Uh, which of the following statements describes the effect these icebergs have on the biodiversity around them? Variety found within a species is increasing, but the number of different species is decreasing. The variety found within the species is decreasing, but the number of different... So I think uh, B is wrong because it's talking about... And, and uh, C is wrong because it's talking about phytoplankton and krill increasing. Yes? So where it's talking about decreasing, no, it's either A or uh, D. Let's go back and check. Hotspots for ocean life, thriving communities of seabirds, uh, floating islands of life, uh, blah, 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 significantly increased uh, other forms of sea life. You know what? I'm pretty sure it's D here. It's saying the variety found within a species. You got more different types of birds and more different species. Is it D? Hey, it is. So a lot of this is reasonably common sense-ish. You can at least narrow it down, Leah, to two answers using common sense, and that's kind of a true or false if you need to. What term uh, refers to information that reflects human experiments, experience within the environment gained over many generations? Exploitation? No. Biodiversity? No. Proliferation? Oh, traditional ecological knowledge. Again, our point is we have cultures that managed to live here in North America for several thousand years without screwing it up. We've been here for a couple of hundred. We're wrecking the environment like crazy. Maybe we could learn from the people that have held on to this for longer than us without breaking it. But we like our toys. Uh, adaptive radiation is most likely to occur. So adaptive radiation is the process of as a population continues to breed, occasionally there are mutations that occur and they make parts of the population more advantageous and more likely to breed. And there are mutations that occur that make parts of the population less advantageous. That line of the population will probably die off. Uh, when is it most likely to occur? When environmental conditions change and the members of a species lack adaptive traits to survive? 
when environmental conditions remain the same, I think they change when environmental conditions change, remain the same. Uh, you know what? I think it's D, isn't it? Environmental conditions change, and the adaptive traits of the species favor the survival and reproduction of members with the different traits. We have a phrase, survival of the... That's really what that's saying in a nutshell. Even though that phrase isn't quite accurate, it's a good way to remember it. Mount St. Helens. We were lucky. We had a volcano erupt in our backyard. Great for science, not, for good for the, not so good for the people that live there. During the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, the surrounding forest was covered in volcanic ash and mud, and mud flows. Slowly, soil formed and pioneer plants followed. Shrub and trees now grow there. This is an example of... No, no. Primary succession? Not a climax community, because that would mean you'd have huge trees, you'd have animals. No, it's still recovering, but it's recovered far faster than we thought. This has really changed our opinion of fa how fast ecologies can recover from disasters. Thankfully, the earth is a little stronger than we thought. Bullfrogs! says, which of the following statements describes the American bullfrog in BC ecosystems? Well, first of all, the fact that they were brought here by an entrepreneur who wanted to start cooking up frog legs, but that didn't pan out. They are definitely a foreign species. So C is wrong, right? Okay. Uh, the threat. They prey upon native species. That is true. Do they eat the prey? Oh, they will outcompete. So they also eat the prey of the native species. That is true. Correct answer? D. This is a major issue, by the way, bullfrogs. Also, Australia, Oregon, BC. What does urban mean? City. Okay. So entire populations of birds across Europe are changing their songs in order to be better heard above the noise of the... Okay, let's read. This change in bird song is due to... I'm going to guess urban noise pollution because it says in order to be better heard. Is it? Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. Yes. If the development of different songs among urban and country birds results in two species, this is an example of uh, of what? No, no, no. Yeah, it's natural selection. The same way as on the Galapagos, which is the main example we looked at, there was a whole bunch of different species, species of finches because they all involved to find a, a certain niche, to occupy a certain niche. Hey, now we're into chemistry, and this is what I think people need the most review on, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Are you ready? You want your periodic table open? All of you. And the other page you're going to be flipping to as soon as we get to radiation is the back page. Also, don't forget, you have the page of polyatomic ions as well. That's a couple of pages in your data sheet too. What is subatomic particle X? How do you know it's a neutron, not a proton? They didn't put pluses. Which of the following is a list of diatomic elements? What's the dumb, clever way we can remember this? Okay. Mr. Hofbrinkle. Hydrogen is diatomic. Oxygen is diatomic. Fluorine is diatomic. Bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. By the way, make sure you clue in. That's the lowercase. It's chlorine. Don't think it's a capital L for lithium, even though lithium is Li. Uh, so which one do we have here? No. No. Uh, no. Yes. Right? We have Bohr models and we have Lewis diagrams. Which atom is represented, or what is represented by the Bohr model shown above? Here is the first key, the number of protons. The number of protons tells you the atomic number. 
which tells you the element. We define an element based on how many protons it has. What is 15 protons? What is atomic number 15? So I know this is phosphorus. Now it's either an ion or an atom. If it's an atom, how many electrons does phosphorus have in its valence shell? Let's go find my periodic table. periodic table. Phosphorus is right here. It normally has one, two, yep. three, four, five ad electrons in its valence shell. How many electrons does this have in its valence shell? This is an ion. This is phosphorus and it's got three extra, extra electrons. We would write it like that if we were writing it as an ion. It's a phosphorus ion. Did I look at the neutrons? Nope. The neutrons, the number of neutrons, tells me if it's an isotope. Use the following Bohr model, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Does this have four covalent bonds? Yeah, we, show, we write ionic bonds differently, covalent bonds. You're sharing the electrons. So this, this statement is supported by the diagram. How many lone pairs of electrons are in the molecule? Pardon me? Let's see. There's a pair. There's a pair. There's a pair. There. You know what? I, yeah, I think, I think none. Lewis diagram. What does the number of dots represent? The number of valence electrons. Okay. An atom of which of the following has the most unpaired electrons? Now, you need to remember that when we start drawing our Bohr atom, there's our nucleus, we said that you could have one, but those are paired. And as soon as you move out, how many are in the second shell? How many electrons? There's Let's do another shell, Mr. Duick. There's one unpaired, two unpaired, three unpaired, four unpaired. But as soon as you go to five, now you only have three unpaired electrons because they start pairing up. As soon as you go to six, now you only have two unpaired electrons because they start pairing up. As soon as you go to seven, you, now you only have one unpaired. So what you're looking for, if you want the most unpaired electrons, I think you're looking for something that has four in its outer shell or three in its outer shell. Let's see. Neon, no, the, everything's paired. Hydrogen only has one. Oh, now fluorine has how many electrons in its outer shell? Seven. So you would go one, two, three. You know what? That's only got one unpaired. How many does boron have in its three. outer shell? Three, not four, three. It has three unpaired because you have, don't have enough to start pairing them up yet. Also recognize that everything we teach you about electrons and things is wrong. Put your phone away. Thank you. Use the following Lewis diagram to answer number 30. Which of the following pairs of elements could be represented by X and Y? Can Y possibly be hydrogen? OK. Um, can X possibly be beryllium? What's beryllium on my period? Well, it's got two outer electrons in its valence shell. Uh, it looks like we're sharing one electron with each other. I think we're looking for something that has, that's in this row here for element number Y or letter Y and something in this row here for element number X because it's got one extra electron to share and it wants one extra electron. Which one? I think this is hydrogen chloride, HCl. Is it D? Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. Which of the following compounds will conduct electricity and re So you're looking for metals. Which of the following are metals? Or sorry, no, no, no. Conduct electricity and react with uh, magnesium to produce hydrogen gas. You're looking for an acid, I believe. Are you not? Acids conduct electricity. And when you drop magnesium in them, you get bubbles. And that bubble was hydrogen gas. We did a lab to that effect. So, uh, no, oh, I'm looking for an acid, right? Acid rain. 
Which indicator could be used to determine if, rain, if a rainwater sample is acid rain? What are we looking at here? We're looking at our data sheet. We have that lovely color chart. Uh, this one here. So I want something that's going to react when it's acidic, which is to the left below 7 on my pH scale. Uh, C? Phenolphthalene? No, that stays colorless. That doesn't help me at all. That turns color if it's uh, basic. Uh, methyl orange? I think methyl orange, unless they said methyl red. Nope. Indigo carmine? Uh, nope, that just stays blue unless it's really, really basic. That wouldn't help me at all. And bromothymol blue? Come on. Come back. Bromothymol blue, uh, you, you know what? That might still be close to, yeah, you know what? I think methyl orange. Let's double check. Oh, pH is less than 4.4. It's got to be methyl orange. If it didn't have less than 4.4, then technically D would partly be, no, less than 4.4. It's got to be A. According to the article, what formula of the acid is responsible for acid rain? Sulfuric acid. Is sulfuric acid on your list of common acids? It is? Really? They gave that to you? Uh, sulfuric acid. What formula? Got to be. The chief culprit in acid rain is classified as, let's go see. Do they use the, ch uh, the chief culprit? There it is right there. The phrase, the chief culprit in acid rain is, Sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide. Sulfur. Uh, sulfur S or SU? S. Dioxide. What is that? Is it a metal oxide? Sulfur is not a metal. Looks like, an, is it C, a non-metal oxide? It's not a, by the way, D, it's not a diatomic molecule. Not a base. By the way, how can I tell something is a base? Yeah, it has to, has a, somewhere in it, right? So process of elimination. We're doing sample exam B. If you have a copy, great. If not, there's extras up here. But see if you got it first. Calcium phosphate. Okay. Calcium, CA. Phosphate, did they say phosphide? No, this is phosphate. First of all, what's the charge? What's the ionic charge on calcium from your periodic table? Calcium is uh, calcium, calcium, two plus? Phosphate, not phosphide. Phosphate, that's a polyatomic ion. Where is it? Phosphate is PO43 negative. Now what? Crisscross. So it's going to be CA3PO42. D. What is the ion charge for Neptunium in the compound? That there. By the way, if you look at your periodic table, where is Neptunium? Find it. Okay, 93 at the bottom. What comes just before Neptunium? From the planet Uranus, then Neptune. What comes right after Neptunium? Pluto. It was, they thought those were the last three elements, so they didn't name them after what were at that time the last three planets. Is Pluto a planet anymore? No, it's just a rock. No, it's a dwarf planet, of which there are several. It's an entirely new category of, extra, of solar bodies. We gave it its own special category. Pluto is more special, not less special. So stop sending Neil deGrasse Tyson hate mail, all you little kids. Okay. He was one of the scientists that demoted it, and he gets hate mail from eight-year-olds because of the stupid dog. Um, Uncrisscross. Or you could just find Neptunium. Uh, where, where was it? It was element number 90. 
three. We got several options. It could be five or three or four or six. I'm leaning towards a five. Does that work in terms of, because remember, this could have been a reduced fraction. It could have been a reduced crisscross. Uh, does that work? Oxygen has a charge of two. Yeah, you know what? That works. I think it's five plus. Yeah? What is the name for the compound COSI? I totally wish that they would have as an answer there, COSI. I think that would be great because some kids would pick. Anyways, okay. First of all, ionic or covalent, and how do you know? Okay, cobalt, metal, non-metal. So we're going to use the I'd rule, but we don't need to go with a penta, tetra, di, tri. Don't need to do that. That's for covalent. So this is going to be cobalt, and it's going to be selenide. It's not going to be mono. Now, is cobalt multivalent? Yes. Ah, it is. So you know what? We're going to have to do our crisscross rule to figure out what works here. It looks like we have one and one. So if I find selenium, it has a charge of two negative. And since uh, this must have also balanced with a two negative, which is why when we crisscrossed, we ended up with one and one. So I'm looking for cobalt two selenide. Covalents are way easier, I think, to get the formula. Di arsenic. What does di mean? What's the uh, symbol for arsenic? Two of those. Pentoxide. What's penta? Okay. Uh, by the way, if there's one, what's the prefix? Mono. But, but if there's one of the first thing, do you put a mono in front of it? No. Just like when there's a single X in math, we don't put a one in front of it. <coughs> Lewis diagram. What is the name of the compound shown above? First of all, I need to figure out ionic or covalent. Well, silicon is a weird one. It's, well, it's not a metal. So this is covalent. How many silicons? One. We could say mono. No, we don't say mono. It's going to be silicon. How many bromides? Four. How do you know tetra? I mean, that's also on your sheet. They don't make you memorize those. That's on the same page as the polyatomic, I think. Yes? Right? Hey, we're all getting 100% on this exam. This is great. This is easy. Science is fun. Which one is inorganic? What makes something organic? What are you looking for? Primarily carbon. Ah, but don't take any carbonates. Uh, CO2 or CO3, those are not organic, even though they contain carbon. Carbon dioxide is not organic. But you're looking for a carbon, and usually oxygens and hydrogens. So B is inorganic. Use the following experimental setup. Graham, it looks like right around number 39, or in this case, number 41, they love to throw a question about conservation of mass. Okay? According to the law of conservation of mass, how much zinc was produ produced? How much mass, by the way, make sure you bring a calculator because you need it for physics and for balancing equations. How much mass was there before the experiment? Whatever 32 plus 96 is, which is what, Nate? 128 grams. How much mass does there have to be at the end? 128 grams. So if we have 76 grams of magnesium chlorate, how much zinc must there be, Nate? Anyone? 52? Matter is neither created nor destroyed. OK, that's a lie. In nuclear reactions, it is. But for the most part, matter is neither created or destroyed. Mass is conserved. And because energy is actually equal to mass, Einstein proved that, you can actually say that mass is conserved because if you calculate the amount of energy that you lose in the... Anyways. Balancing an equation. 
What equation is needed in front of the CO2 to balance the following combustion reaction? How do you know this is a combustion reaction? Because the products are what? Carbon dioxide and water. When stuff burns, you get carbon dioxide and water. Okay. I probably would not start out with the hydrogen or the oxygen. I would start out with the carbon, I think, because the hydrogens and the oxygens in these reactions show up so often, we kind of hope they take care of themselves. How many carbons do I have on the left-hand side? So how many do I need on the right-hand side? How many do I have? So the first thing I would do is I would try putting a two there. Now that changes the number of oxygens. How many oxygens do I have on the right grand total? Five. So how many am I going to need over here? Hmm. Well, let's tackle the hydrogens next. How many hydrogens do I have on the left? How many do I have here? Now I got six. Now how many oxygens do I have on the right-hand side? Let's see. Four and three is what? I got seven. That's still not going to work very well. So what? I have no idea. Sorry? You know what I would, because I need seven and I can't get a seven with a two there. You know what I would do? I would try doubling everything because that's going to give me a factor of two. I would say, you know what? Try putting a four there. Try putting a six there. What does that do? Let's see. That gives me four carbons. I need to have a two there now. That gives me 12 hydrogens and 12 hydrogens. I'm good. How many oxygens on the right? Eight plus, plus six is? I can put a seven there. This is balanced. Now I can answer the question, what coefficient is needed in front of the CO2? Number 49, sorry, 43. Magnesium chloride reacts with sodium sulfide to produce magnesium sulfide and sodium chloride. This is a double replacement reaction. We're gonna, they want us to balance the equation. Okay. Magnesium, symbol? Chloride, Cl, what's the charge? What's the valence of, uh, what's the valence charge on magnesium? Two, what about on chloride? What about on chlorine? One. One, okay, so when I crisscross, I'm starting out with MgCl2 is combined with. What's the second thing? What are we combining it with? I know that's Na. Mr. Dewitt, can you tell me a joke about sodium? Nah. Uh, sure. Can you tell me a joke about potassium? Okay. Back to here. Uh, sulfur, symbol S. What's the valence charge on sodium? That's a one, I seem to recall, yes. What's the valence charge on sulfur? Crisscross, you'll need Na2S. Produces magnesium sulfide. Magnesium is two, sulfide is two. Oh, that's a nice crisscross. And sodium chloride, that one I know is table salt, NaCl. I know that's a, that one balances, or that one crisscrosses nicely. Now we balance. What do you want to start with? Magnesium, I got one on the left, one on the right. That was easy, we're done. No, uh, chlorine, how many chlorines on the left? How many on the right? Oh, what just changed? How many sodiums do I have on the right? Two. How many do I have on the left? Oh, that's good. How many sulfurs do I have on the left? One. You know what? I think that's it. Yes? This is now balanced. What coefficient is needed in front of sodium chloride? A two. And this is a double replacement reaction. How many questions are there on the exam? 
80, so we're just past halfway and we've been going about 45 minutes, so we're going pretty good. Use the following setup. What type of chemical reactions? So we're taking lead to nitrite and we're mixing it with potassium iodide. I don't think we're getting a synthesis because remember a synthesis was A plus B becomes AB. We're adding two things to two things, a compound to a compound. I don't think it's a neutralization. That would be an acid and a base. An acid would start with hydrogen, except for the weird one, chiku, right, vinegar. Uh, a base would have an OH. Oh, I don't think it's a combustion. What do you guys think this one is? Double replacement. I think it's a double replacement. Which of the following products is a, co is, is a product? Which of the following compounds is a product? So we have lead and uh, what's nitrate? That's a polyatomic and I don't have those memorized. It's either NO2 or NO3. Or what is it? NO3. What's the uh, valence of lead? You know what? I don't care right now. I'm just going to say we have, uh, and we have potassium iodide. I guess we're going to have lead is going to combine with iodide and potassium is going to combine with the NO3. Uh, it, uh, nit double checking, double checking. Uh, nitrate, that's NO3, not NO2. Is that right? You guys read correctly? Okay, I guess the product is that. Yes, 45D. I didn't bother balancing because they didn't seem to care. I just wanted to get the reaction. Why does kindling burn faster than a tree trunk? It ain't that, it ain't that, it ain't that. Yeah. So we have our uh, reaction rate control factors. What were the five reaction rate control factors, or the four? Temperature, surface area. Presence of a catalyst, concentration. concentration, which some of you lack, and yeah, yeah. The yep. uh, There's actually just four. You can break it. Uh, the video I showed my kids a video that broke it into five because they broke up uh, concentration into two things. I think. Anyways, we're good. Radioactivity. Periodic table. And then the very back page, which has the isotopes, which has the half-lifes, which has the radioactive products. All right. What does the mass number of an isotope represent? D, because electrons have almost no mass. What does the atomic number represent? Protons, which means if you want the neutrons, that's the mass number minus the atomic number. for what it's worth. Cobalt 60. Oh, if you forget how they write it, they've given you an example. The mass goes there. The atomic number goes there. So if you blank out, you might find an example somewhere else on the provincial to remind you how to write it. Undergoes beta decay. OK, so we're going to start out with that. It gives off a beta particle. What's the beta particle from the back page? What's the charge? Sorry, what's the mass? Zero. And then we have beta. It's also an electron. What's the charge? Now, these numbers have to balance. How many do I have here as a mass? Meant to be really obvious, huh? How, you know what? It's got to be a 60 here. These numbers have to balance. I have a 27. This is a minus 1. What must go here? So this still works out to 27. And that tells you your new element. What's element number 28? Sorry? Nickel? There's the daughter isotope. OK? Half-life. So a sealed container contains 200 grams after 24 days, this container only has 25 grams of radioactive iodine. Let's start with the 200, and let's divide by 2 in our heads. 100, that's one half-life. Next. 
That's two half-lives. Next. That's our goal. That's three half-lives. Apparently, three half-lives have gone by. How many days have gone by grand total? How many half-lives? How can I fit three half-lives into 24 nice and easily? Right? Yep. Okay. Once again, here's a good example of a nuclear reaction balanced equation. And again, you'll notice 209 plus 64 does give you 273. And if you add 83 and 128, you will get 111. Now, what type of reaction is occurring here? What are we giving off? What's an N? Neutron. So it is not beta or alpha. Okay? It's either fusion or fission, and you have to, I know the two words sound an awful lot alike. I have always remembered these because I know what the word fissure means. A fissure is a crack in the earth, splitting up. Fusion is when you're combining stuff. This is fission. You're giving off a neutron, and you're breaking apart two atoms. Is it fission? Or if you, let me double check, Mr. Duick. This says fusion. A, I stand corrected. We're taking two atoms and we're, com yeah, right. We're giving off a neutron still. We're combining them into one big one. We're fusing them. Sorry, read that wrong. Okay. says, which of the following particles are emitted during the three-step decay process? And the key is, look at both the mass number and the atomic number. So in the first one, we're starting out with uranium with a mass of 238, an atomic number of 92. So we're starting out here. Where do we end up? What's the second thing we turn into? A mass of what? A mass of what? 234. Atomic number of what? Uh, what did we lose? Right? What is that? So we got at least one alpha. Let's keep going. Then what did we turn into? A mass of what? Oh, uh, 234. The three didn't show up. A mass of what? Still 234? Atomic number of what? And it says it's palladium. What did we lose? Zero mass. And it looks like we uh, somehow have to do that. Oh, you've given off a beta. Right? Then what? What's our new mass? Still 234? What's our new atomic number? 92. We turned back into a different isotope of uranium. What did we lose? No mass, a negative one. You know what? It looks like we have one alpha particle, two beta particles. Okay? Got to be. Has to be. Hey, we've just finished radiation. Now we're moving on to the physics section. So now you want to be open to the very back page of your data booklet that has the physics formulas on it. Yes? Rob, uh, Rob. metals, non-metals. Yeah, I'm just saying, if you want, what's the metal or non-metal? Metals are the left-hand side of the periodic table, the green, the yellow, and the blue. Yeah. Orange and light blue, these are the noble gases because they're, they're inert, and there's your non-metals. Hydrogen is kind of put in both because it's weird, but it's technically a whatever you want to call it. Hey, what's the answer to 52? Yeah, negative 3. Direction, negative, down. 
Displacement is your change in position. You ended up below from where you started from. Here's a graph. Which of the following variables can be determined from the graph? Can you find your position? What are we measuring on the y-axis? So yes. Can you find your velocity? How do you find velocity if you have a position versus time graph? So yes. Can you find your displacement? Well, your displacement is your change in position, which is final minus initial. The displacement is they ended up at 8. They started at 2. The displacement is 6. Yes, the answer here? You can find all of them. During which, number 54, during which time interval does the car have the greatest negative velocity? A. Steepest negative slope, A. A tightrope walker starts two meters from the center of a rope. Which of the following statements describes the sequence of events that follows? Okay. From zero to two seconds, the walker moves in a negative direction. Does that seem right to you? Yes. Yeah, walking backwards on the tightrope. Then, what happens on this section right here between two seconds and five seconds? Standing still. So this is correct. This is correct. From five to nine seconds... The walker moves in a positive direction. Is that correct? No, walking backwards again, as a matter of fact. Correct answer? A. Looking at exam B, if you have a copy, get it out. If not, there's one here. Oh, during which time interval is the tightrope walker moving with a positive velocity? Between what two seconds? Nine and ten. Right? Which of the following events has the greatest displacement? Well, I think we're going to use displacement equals velocity times time. Because I see in each question a velocity and a time. So, what's 25 times 8? 400, you say? 200, you say? Thank you. What's 20 times 10? That one I'll get right, 200. What's 60 or 4 times 60? 240. What's 10 times 20? 200. C. The following photograph shows Olympian Usain Bolt. I'm going to assume all of you have seen him run at least once somewhere on YouTube or on TV. He is spectacular. In the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Usain Bolt set two world records. He ran the 100-meter race in 9.69 and the 200-meter race in 18.3. What's his average velocity? By the way, why do they have to ask for the average velocity? Why didn't they just say, what's his velocity? Yeah, Jordan. Yeah, he's accelerating. In fact, he's accelerating about the first 45 meters or so before he hits his full speed. So average velocity. All right. Well, average velocity is distance divided by time. Is that on your formula sheet? Yes? Let's go find this. Average velocity is your distance divided by time. I dropped the change in the distance divided by time. So it's going to be uh, for the 100 meter and then for the 200 meter. For the 100, the distance is 100 divided by 9.69. And for the 200, the distance is 200 divided by 19.3. Again, make sure you bring a calculator to the provincial exam. 100 divided by 9.69. 10.32? No, yes, no. Oh, you know what? I'm done. But, okay. 200 divided by 19.3. 
10.36. It is B. Number 59 is tricky. It says a dragonfly travels 100 meters north at nine meters per sec at eight meters per second, then 50 meters north at 10 meters per second. What's its average velocity? Well, By the way, which of these two answers are dumb? Look, if you went 8 meters per second and then later on you went 10 meters per second, there's no way you averaged more than 10 meters per second. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah. I think what I would do is I would find out, if I really wanted to calculate this, I would find out the time how far he traveled. So I'm going to go like this. I want to find out in the first trip, he was traveling time, it says, is uh, distance divided by velocity. So 100 divided by 8. How long was he traveling for the first section? Can someone do that, please? 100 divided by 8. 12.5 seconds. Then he was traveling 50 divided by 10. I can do that in my head. Five seconds. All right, now I can answer the whole question. How long was he traveling for grand total? How many seconds? How long was he traveling for grand total? How many seconds? 17.5. How far did he travel grand total? This is his average velocity. See, the problem is I can't use the numbers that they gave me because I need to figure out how long he was traveling for for each section because average velocity is total distance divided by total time. Well, they didn't give me the total time, so I had to calculate it. Uh, 150 divided by 17.5. And I get 8.57 or 8.6 meters per second. Okay. Now we're moving into acceleration. This was the nasty velo this was the nasty velocity question, 59. Now we move on to acceleration because now it's a velocity time graph, not a position time graph. What's the slope on a velocity time graph? Ah! Got your attention? Here we go. What's the slope on a velocity time graph? Okay. We're going to pause for one second. Okay, hey, what's the slope on a velocity time graph? Acceleration, okay? So, number 60, the acceleration is negative during what? Z. Where is the velocity negative? Listen close, where is the velocity negative? All of X and part of Y. What's happening here? Describe it. The person is driving backwards. They start slowing down, still going backwards, still going backwards, still going backwards, still going backwards. For a split second, they come to a stop. Where is that on the graph? Yeah, with the x-intercept, right? Right. That's where they've come to a stop. Now, which way are they traveling? Forwards, forwards, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. Then they start slowing down. They're still going forwards, even though the line is slanty downwards. The line is above zero. Still going forwards, but they're decelerating. They're hitting the brakes. You know what? This is somebody backing up really fast. Sorry, backing up at a constant speed. Hitting the brakes to stop. Putting their car in forward. And then slowing down after they start going forwards. This is parking lot driving, really. This is somebody doing some kind of a K-turn or a U-turn or something like that. 
Right? Yeah, yeah? A little easier when you have your exam in front of you, isn't it? Yeah, shut up. Okay. So, that leads us to number 61. At the point where the li graph lines cross, Karen and Jane have the same, same what? Do they have the same acceleration? No, because, oh, what would have the same acceleration? Two lines that were what? Parallel. In math 10, two systems that never cross. Ah, a little math 10 review for some of you. Uh, sorry? What's the answer? Yeah, they have the same height, which must be the same velocity. The acceleration, number 62, the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is about one-sixth of that on the Earth. Anybody remember what's the acceleration on the Earth? Now, yeah, those of you who take Physics 11, you'll memorize that next year. By the way, if you're a nerd like me standing in amusement park line rides and you're doing math in your head because you want to know how fast you're going to go, instead of using negative 9.8, what's a nice round number close to negative 9.8 that you can do math with? Literally, you can figure out a lot of your speeds in amusement park rides and how many g-forces you're going to go through if you want. You can take physics. Um, so negative 9.8. How would the motion of a ball that is dropped by an astronaut on the moon compare with the motion of the ball that is dropped? You know what? Earth. Moon. It would look like this. But more exaggerated. What did you notice? Did you see it? Which one fell slower? Now, that's because of air resistance on the Earth. On the moon, it would be because of the gravitational field strength. Okay? The moon ball would accelerate slower, would appear to fall slower. So what's the correct answer? Both balls would not have the same acceleration. And because of that, they wouldn't get to the same maximum speed. The maximum speed would be lower, not greater. My wish for all of you, for every one of you, is that someday before you die, you'll all be able to go to the moon and try this out yourself. I hope your lifetime is the lifetime that we actually get people up there permanently. That would be cool. Science nerd moment over, back to real life. A ball thrown upward at 10 meters per second will reach the top of its path in one second where its velocity is zero meters per second. It will return to your hand reaching a final velocity of negative 10 meters per second. So how long does it take to get to the top? How many seconds does it take to get to the top? One. How many seconds will it take to get back down? What goes up must come down. Yep, one second. Okay, so I'm looking for a graph that's how many seconds long, grand total? Two, doesn't help me, they all are. I'm looking for a graph, how fast are you traveling at one second? What's your velocity at t equals one? Read the, huh? Zero, so I'm looking for a graph that's zero high at t equals one. Well, that gets rid of that puppy, right? What's your velocity at time zero? What's your VI? Read the question. What's your V initial? No, your V initial can't be zero, otherwise you wouldn't go anywhere. This is the V initial of zero if I'm throwing something. What's your V initial? I'm looking at time zero. How high do I want my velocity to be? Positive 10. So I'm looking for a graph that's 10 high on the y-axis. Uh, no. Now, uh, is it A or is it B? Ah, what's your final velocity right when it hits your ground? I'll give you a hint. What goes up must come down. What's your final velocity? Negative 10. And that slope there is the acceleration due to gravity, always negative. Remember, you can have a positive velocity and a negative acceleration. You do it all the time in the car when you hit the brakes. You're going which way? Forwards, but which way are you accelerating when you hit the brakes? Backwards. No, I'm not, I'm moving forward. That's not the case. You're moving forward, your velocity is forwards, your acceleration is backwards. It's called slowing down. What do they want us to find in question 64, okay, it says change in velocity, which is, according to my formula sheet, uh, we're in the acceleration section, acceleration times time. 
acceleration times change in time. Did they tell me the acceleration? Oh, wait a minute. I don't need to go that high tech. I'm making this way more complicated. What's that right there? It's a velocity. Which one? Start initial or final? Initial. What's this one here? Final. Oh, what's changing anything? In your head, it's going to be negative 15 minus negative 6. Careful, there is a minus minus there. What's that minus minus the same as? So it's going to be negative 15 plus 6. The change in velocity is negative 9. The acceleration would be negative 9 divided by 3, or negative 3 meters per second squared. All right. What are they asking me to find in number 65? What are they asking me to find in number 65? T equals question mark. Okay. Time. I can do this. What did they give me? What's that 20? Which one? Never say velocity. There's always two. Okay. They gave me VI is 20. What's that 5? VF. What's that negative 1.5? Units, you can look at it. So I'm looking for an equation that has the t by itself, uh, this one, except I'm not going to write delta v, because what's delta v the same as over here? What's delta v the same as? OK. So time is going to be v final minus v initial. You see where we got that from? A change in velocity over A, but I plug this in right away. I hardly ever write change in velocity. I almost always just go, change in anything is final minus initial. Why don't I just go sprinting to that right away? Uh, it's going to be 5 minus 20 divided by negative 1.5, which is what? By the way, should time be positive or negative? Why? Time is a scalar. What's a vector? All vectors have what? Two things. Magnitude and direction. Speed, scalar or vector? Scalar. Velocity, scalar or vector? It would be great if there was some dumb easy way that I can remember that speed is a scalar and that velocity is a vector. If I was a good teacher, I'm sure I would have come up with something, but I suck. Uh, distance. Distance, distance, scalar or vector? Careful. Distance is a scalar. What's the vector equivalent of distance? Displacement. OK? Time is always a scalar because it has no direction. Well, I watched this movie once where Einstein's, no, we're not going backwards in time, sorry. Hey, what'd you get? B, yes? Sixty-six. Turn the page if you haven't already. It's all on the same page. Oh, you guys really shrunk yours down. Four to a page. I went two to a page. That's more environmentally friendly. I got to give them credit. Uh, what's the car's acceleration? How can I find the acceleration here? Slope, rise over run. So I'm gonna. I usually go. How about right here and right here? What's the rise? Don't say twenty-five because it's not. What is it? Fifteen. Over. What's the run? 10. Don't say 5. I know it's 5 squares, but each square doesn't count as 1. 15 divided by 10, I'm pretty sure, is positive 1.5 meters per second squared. What do they want me to find in number 67? Okay, I need an equation for acceleration. It says it's change in velocity over time, but I've told you I never write change in velocity, Leah. I go straight to final minus initial. All right, Mr. Smarty Pants' peoples. Mac, what's the final velocity? What's the initial velocity? What's the time? 
By the way, are you cluing in? It's worth memorizing what units go with which measurements because then it's fairly plug and chug. As soon as I see meters per second, I know that's a velocity. As soon as I see meters per second per second or meters per second square, that's an acceleration. As soon as I see seconds, that's a time. Uh, what's the time? 0 0.025. Go ahead. What is it? Can't be eight. Is it 320? Okay. By the way, do me a favor. Anybody that has a calculator, can you go 320 divided by 9.8? That soccer ball is undergoing 32 Gs of acceleration. Human beings can handle about 10 Gs without permanent damage. You don't want to get kicked in the head by a soccer player. That would give you a concussion. 32 Gs would do damage. In some football tackles, football players are taking 25, 30, and 40 Gs, and that's why you may notice in the NFL, they're starting to realize, oh, these guys are getting head injuries, even though they're not showing it for a while, it's coming up later. For those of you who play football, sorry, but there's your public service announcement. Okay. Now we open up to our plate tectonic section. We have our maps of North America. Our world tectonic plate boundary, page six and seven. Number 68. Which of the following represents the motion of a seismic wave that can travel through all of the Earth's layers? First of all, what is the wave that goes through all of the Earth's layers? Which goes through most of the Earth layers except for liquids? Which ones travel along the surface? What do L stand for? Yeah, believe it or not, love. But I think about it as last, because they arrive last. Which ones arrive first? That's why they're called primary. Okay. Now, primary m waves, they move in the same direction as the earthquake. Think moving back and forth. I know in my class I had people stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and move back and forth. Okay? Sorry? How do you answer that? I know you just did. I don't know that. Remember how the Richter scale works, by the way? The Richter scale and the pH scale are similar in that they're powers of 10. If you have an earthquake that has a Richter scale 6.8 and you're comparing it with an earthquake that has a Richter scale 4.8, how many times stronger is the 6.8? 10 squared, 100. Or if it's pH, how many times more basic is that than that? 10 squared, 100 times more basic. They're logarithmic power of 10 scales. And there are lots of scales like that. You'll probably look at them more in Math 12. Uh, which of the following, did I hit record again? Yeah, I did. Which of the following correctly identifies the lithosphere? Which one is the lithosphere? Pardon me? Lithosphere contains the continental crust, the oceanic crust, it's the crust. So B is wrong because it looks like they're excluding the oceanic crust. Uh, C is wrong because we're including. What's that top layer of the mantle called, by the way? The asthenosphere. That one? The one that I can never say without spitting like crazy? So A. Use the following map. So. Please remember a lot of the symbols and notation, it's on your data sheet. You don't have to have it memorized. For example, you do not need to memorize the symbol for a divergent boundary or a convergent boundary or a transform boundary or the symbol for a mountain or a volcano or for plate movement. That's all on there. You don't need to memorize those symbols. They're all on there. And you may have noticed they occasionally ask you questions about those symbols. What they're really saying is, have you been clever enough to read the legend that's on your little chart? Right? 
So uh, what type of plate boundary occurs at location two right there? Well, it looks like we have a plate coming in from the left-hand side and a plate coming in from the right-hand side. It looks like we have this. What do we call that? Convergent. What's divergent? What's transform? Okay. Slide past each other. Uh, transform would be. Uh, straight line. Yep, a little trickier to find. Where on the map is there an oceanic, oceanic plate boundary? Check one only. I see East Pacific plate and I see Antarctic plate. Eh, maybe. Uh, you know what? I don't think this is oceanic. I don't think two is oceanic, oceanic. This is the South America or the American plate, whatever it's called. I don't know all the names. Uh, here I have, uh, hmm, what do you think the correct answer is to number 71? I think, I think you could say that there is one there and one there, two oceanic plates. I think the correct answer is B. Definitely it's not the second one. So you would say it definitely isn't C and D. Use the following questions. Okay. Identify the mapping symbol. Well, first of all, it looks like these two plates are diverging. Right? So let's go down all column X. Uh, what's the symbol for diverging? That thing there? So I would say no, yes. Would I have volcanoes right there where they're diverging? Oh, maybe, okay, I'm not you. Well, I come back to that. What about location Y? Here I have converging. What's the symbol for converging? This puppy here. So what's that symbol? Uh, diverging, that's definitely wrong. That's transform. Oh, do I need to go any further? I think I've process of elimination. Did, have I not already? I didn't really need to worry about the volcano -y thingy that I wasn't quite so sure about. Oh, yeah, and that's a transform right there. Oh, and uh, I guess there would be a little volcano symbol right there. What's formed at location X? Which kind? Are we in the ocean or above the ocean? Yeah, it's tough to tell. Well, I know it's not that. That's where you have one plate going underneath another plate. It ain't that. It's not a volcanic iron. Oh, you know what? This is a mid-ocean ridge. What's the difference between A and C? I was scared someone was going to ask me that question. I think in uh, C, I think that's when you have in the ocean a subduction occurring, and so you have a landmass getting pushed underneath, uh, an oceanic plate going underneath the continental plate, and there is a trench there, but it's not formed by two plates spreading apart and lava slowly flowing in. I think that's right. I hope. 74, what type of earthquakes can occur at region Z? Shallow focus? Really? I didn't know that. Okay. Which of the following choices refers to the sinking of the crust into the mantle as a result of both ridge push and gravity? Right? That's where once the slab starts, it's like when you're standing on the edge of a swimming pool. If someone starts to pull you in, it's much easier for you to fall in. When part of your slab has already started sinking underneath the continental or the oceanic plate, it's going to start pulling the rest of the slab with it. Yes, thank you, Captain Obvious. Or there's an echo in here. 
Nearly done. Which of the following forces are causing the eastward movement of the Nazca plate? Well, let's go look at the picture. Nazca plate, right there. Let's see, it is moving to the east. Here it looks like I have a divergent boundary, so it looks like there's some kind of a ridge going on right here. And it looks like we have, uh, we're moving in, it looks like we have some kind of a slab pull convergence right here. Let's go look at the answers. I think we have slab pull. I think we have ridge push, and I think we have mantle convection. You know what? I think it's all of them, right? If I go look at this, here there is the mantle being split apart as the lava flows and pushes as the new rock is formed. So there is the first and third answers, and there is your slab pull as it's getting pulled underneath. Translation, probably a fair number of volcanoes. Oh, yeah, lots of volcanoes and earthquakes there. What is responsible for the formation of these volcanoes? Hotspot, Hot convince me. Well, since the plate is all moving in the same direction, it can't be a subduction or a spreading ridge or a transform, because that's when you had stuff moving in different directions. It's a hot spot. A weak point in the Earth's crust. The mantle has bubbled through. What's the answer to number 78? <coughs> yep. Which of the following tectonic features produces the greatest amount of new crust? Okay. Sorry, what? Yeah, it's in the middle of the ocean, like right here. This is where lava is bubbling up from underneath, hitting the water, solidifying, pushing out new rock, replacing it with more molten rock from below. That's where new crust is being formed, mid-ocean ridges. Last one. Woohoo! <coughs> Here's our magnetometer. Which of the following geologic features was explained by the pattern of alternating? North and south polarities found on the ocean crust. Also added to evidence for mid-ocean ridges because we knew when the, when the north and south pole had traded places and we could detect that in the rock itself because when the rock was liquid, the iron pointed one way. And then when new rock was formed, when the poles had switched, now the iron pointed another way. And you literally see this ribboning pattern. There is one exam, boys and girls.